Uh, that's a carrot and that's a UV disk spectrometer. Uh, about the size of an IR, it has a light source. Okay. I have a sample placed somewhere on the instrument. Yeah. Looking at absorbing UV dis light. Alright. Uh, you do have electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. You look at this in Jinkim? Okay, so you know the ins and outs of your electromagnetic spectrum. Alright. Uh, you know different names for different sections of the electromagnetic spectrum. Gamma rays, X-rays, UV vis, IR, microwave, radio. Which one's higher in energy? Which end is higher in energy? Gamma rays, yes. Radio waves are weakest. Which ones have the longest wavelength? Radio waves have longer wavelength. Which one's higher in energy? Uh, UV or IR? Which one's higher in energy? UV or visible? Uh huh. In the visible, what are the colors of the visible? Of which which color has the highest energy? Uh huh. Violet, blue. UV. Visible. Blue and red. What's after blue if you keep going to the high energy side? Uh, or violet. What's that? Violet and what? Ultraviolet. Yeah. Low energy side. Red. What's after red? Infrared. Yes. Uh, UV is typically about 200 to 400 nanometers. With ultraviolet, we're going to give values in nanometers, which is a wavelength. In IR, we don't give wavelength. What do we give in IR? Inverse. Inverse. Which is, what's the centimeter of? Centimeter is a measurement of what? Yes, the wavelength, so it's actually, we give reciprocal wavelength. And we call that a what? A wave number. It's actually a number of waves in a, in a certain length. Wave number. Uh, it's reciprocal, but it's in centimeters. Reciprocal centimeters. Uh, you could give nanometers instead. Everybody can convert centimeters to nanometers. Okay. Well, UV invisible, UV vis typically we give numbers just in wavelength, not reciprocal, just in wavelength, and it's in nanometers, not centimeters. Typical UV range is 200 to 400 nanometers. Visible, we expect longer wavelengths, right? Because visible is weaker, weaker in energy, lower in energy. Longer wavelengths, about 400 to 800. So this is the range. Uh, here's an example of UV this spectrum of uh, butadiene. You might recall this 1,3 butadiene. There was really no isomer, so 1,3 is not absolutely necessary. We can just call it butadiene, yeah? Uh, here's your UV disk spectrum. Much more simple than IR. IR has lots of peaks. This hardly looks like peaks at all. What do we have here? X-axis, wavelength. What we say? 200 to 400 is UV and 400 to 800? It's on the 200 to 300. It's basically flat line. There's no other absorbance. This is your absorbance. It starts at 200. It's absorbing. All this is absorbing. Okay? Zero to some... This can vary a year. This is basically just uh, some arbitrary scale. Zero to one or zero to 100. Okay? 
absorbent. And so at 200 nanometers, it's absorbing. Then as you start going to higher wavelength, longer wavelength, within the UV, you get even more absorption. Where's the maximum absorption? Right here, which is at what wavelength? Well, it's 217. That's 217. The point of maximum absorption is called the lambda max. Lambda meaning wavelength. The wavelength of maximum absorbance is 217 nanometers for this compound. But that's a UV disc spectrum. It's just showing the absorbance. Just like when you take an IR, it's showing the absorbance of the IR. But you get a lot of peaks there. Here it's just one nice little absorbance curve. The lambda max of 217 becomes a physical constant, just like a density or a melting point. Okay? And butadiene is always 217. Now that can be solvent dependent. Whenever you do a UV biz, typically you dissolve the compound, then they solve it. Sometimes the solvent can change the lambda max a little bit. Really need to be getting the solvent here. Oh, it's solvent dependent. Uh, is there any absorbance? Does butadiene absorb at 300 nanometers? Yeah. Uh, it depends on if this is just a flat line or if there's any there, but it's very darn little, right? Does butadiene absorb at 500 nanometers? Go ahead. Why do you think it's not on there? It, it's just flat line all out there. Okay? Or it would have been shown. So does butadiene absorb in the visible range? Which is what? 400 to 800? Apparently not. No. That's going to be important. Next slide or two. Okay, what's going on? Why do we get an absorbance? Well, think, think back to IR. Why do you get absorbances in IR? Why do you get absorbances in IR? What's, what's the physical phenomenon that's going on? The bonds stretch and vibrate. Stretch is a type of vibration, most common. And thus what? And thus? Well, the phenomenon is that this, this frequency, it's, it's some physics here, okay? And I, I can't completely explain it, but there's physics. Uh, this this stretching frequency. Somebody throw me some IR. <laughs> There's an interaction that leads to the to the frequency going to a higher frequency. You only go here if you absorb the energy. Thus, from some source, I took some energy, and we can plot that: how much you take, how much you absorb. What is the actual physics that gets the absorption? Well, you can keep going and going. It's pure physics. Uh, light physics. Um, but it's probably because light is waves. And you've got this frequency has a harmonic and, and waves interacting and building upon each other. And they, okay? But that can be discussed. But basically, it's the vibration. And by the way, the IR you throw at me has to match this vibration for the, for the absorbance to take place. Right? Okay. So that's some discussion about why I, how you get a peak with IR. IR. How do you get absorbance with UV vis? What's going on? What's going on is electron excitation. We're exciting electrons. Sometimes UV vis is called electronic spectrum. An electronic spectrum. Because you're really you're probing the electrons, exciting electrons. Let's look at that closer. 
What type of electrons can you excite and where do you excite them to? First off, the compound's got different types of electrons. What type? Bonding and unbonding. That's two different types. Non-bonding we typically call lone pairs. What types of different bonding electrons can you have? Sigma bonds, pi bonds. So right there we just named three. Each of these types of electrons can be excited. This is showing it here. The sig sigma electrons can be excited. Excited to where though? Antibonding orbitals, excited state orbitals. You talked about this in Jinkin. Where do these orbitals come from? I mean, if I just draw a, a compound, right? I mean, just acetone. Like, look at the lone pair. Where can we excite the lone pair to? Those lone pairs are in hybrid orbitals. But where can we excite them to? I thought you covered this in Jenkin, right? Where do you where do you excite them to? The tree thing where you draw the anti-bonding thing. It's like one here and then one here and the anti-bonds with it. Yeah, I mean that's how you do it. And what does it all mean? What, what are you doing? You learn what it means, right? So, so just explain it. What are you What are you doing when you're excited an electron? Put it in a higher energy state. Yeah, higher energy state, but to where? Where, where are you excited to? <laughs> to what? I hope you discussed this in Genkim. I mean, you can be excited from ground state uh, orbitals to excited state orbitals. Excited state orbitals are uh, denoted with a star, right? So where's, where's the excited state orbital at? What type of orbitals are here? Uh, two, an sp2 hybrid and an sp3 hybrid interacting to make sigma bond. P orbital, P orbital interacting to make pi bond. Where, where are the excited, where are the antibonding or excited state orbitals at? Anything there? You don't know where they're at? Can you, can you put them in a D orbital? Put what in the D orbital? Any of the electrons, can they just bounce up to the D orbital? Or? Well, there's no, none of these atoms have D orbitals. And a D orbital would not necessarily be an excited orbital. Do it? There's rings around each atom that like jumps up to the next ring. Rings, I think. Rings around each atom. Like orbitals around each atom. Okay, so, so carbon has. They have some electrons. Yeah. I think you're thinking about S would be like the innermost yeah. range. And then they end up up to the. But it, yeah. Like it, they have like SP, but they wouldn't have D. Well, carbon has, has S electrons and P electrons. But we mixed them. So they just jumped to the other. Well, if it's sp3, you hybridize all of them. Get to know where the excited state is. Okay, well, what we have here is we have molecular orbital theory. Is that right? Yes. You cover molecular orbital theory in Jinkim? Okay, molecular orbital theory is a theory that provides you with excited state orbitals. Okay. Everything we've been doing is just valence bonding. There's no excited state orbitals in that theory. Okay. MO, molecular orbital theory. 
That's where you, that theory has excited state orbitals. Okay? And you have an orbital here and an orbital here, which come from here. And because this, this can interact constructively or it can interact destructively. And now you get two orbitals. You call one uh, an excited state, but usually your electrons sit here. But then this can be excited. One of these can be excited up to this one. But what do you call that other than the excited state? Excited state, antibinding orbital. Excited is an antibinding orbital. Do what? The excited orbital is an antibinding orbital. I'd have to think about it. I'm pretty sure, yes. Um, I mean, it says it here too, antibinding, yeah. So, oh, I mean, what we're talking about is molecular orbital theory. So when you say all these lines, you were doing molecular orbital theory. Well, that's, right. You got to be able to see the forest, not just looking at the, the trees. You got to know what you're doing. Because if you don't know what you're doing, you, whatever you're learning is not relevant, applicable. You're just going through the motions, right? You have instructors that have BS cards? Who's, who, who ask you to, anytime you don't understand what we're doing, you need to raise a card and say BS? Y'all need to call BS. You need to say, hold on here. What are we doing here? Why is this relevant? Okay, let's move on. Um, MO theory. I'll, provides you with understanding of molecular orbitals. Where does all that come from? A lot of math. Okay, it's a different higher level or uh, bonding theory other than valence bonding, which we've been doing, which you know more of. Okay, by the way, when you get to organic two, you will do more MO theory because you have to do that to understand aromaticity. Aromatic compounds like benzene. Okay, MO theory. MO theory provides excited state orbitals. Thus, if electrons sit here, we can excite them to an excited state orbital. Various transitions can take place. Sigma electrons can go from a sigma, sigma to sigma star, but they could also maybe go from sigma to pi star. Lots of transitions can take place. Non-bonding electrons, long pairs, can be excited to maybe a pi star, a sigma star, Various transitions. Question, which of these transitions requires the most energy? The one on the far right. The one on the far right. That requires the most energy. In terms of light, would that be high, long wavelength or short wavelength? What type of light would do this? Because everything's quantized. Shorter wavelength light is going to be needed to do this transition. Which is the weakest on here, or the easiest? This one? Yeah. What type of electrons are being excited here? Lone pairs. Does it make sense that it's easiest to excite a lone pair? It's not participating in your bonding. Lone pairs are easiest to excite. Why was MO needed? Theories are developed often because they're needed to explain something. MO was needed to explain stuff like this, uh, UV vis. Uh, and the theory explains a lot of other stuff too, like aromaticity and on and on. Um, okay. Uh, so this is going to be a higher energy transition. By the way, exciting a sig sigma bonded electrons takes a lot of energy. That is actually low wavelength, below 200, turns out, below 200. We typically don't scan below 200. Back over here, did we scan below 200? We just started, and when we started, we were already absorbing. But guess what? This compound probably absorbs over here below 200. Because it's got sigma, it's got some sigma electrons. Okay, 
Why don't we scan below 200? Because below 200, oxygen absorbs. And if you try to scan over there, you're just going to get a big absorbance for oxygen. So we typically don't do it. To get real good data over there, you have to remove oxygen. When you run an IR, you put the little compound up there. Is there any oxygen up there also? Yeah, it's all around. But it doesn't hurt the IR. It does hurt the UV below 200. It obscures it. If you, run a, if you want to get data below 200, you have to do it under vacuum. Remove the oxygen. That's why below 200 is often called vacuum UV. All right? Most cheap introductory, the cheaper, I don't call them cheap, because it ain't cheap. The lower end UVs are not going to scan below 200 because they're not set up to deal with oxygen. Okay, that's what's going on. This is how we get it. And so here the electron sits. Somebody throws some UV. Some UV. Boom, I just absorbed it and I went to a higher energy level. I now have more energy. Okay, let's move ahead here. Here's another UV vis. Different compound. Uh, what, types of, what type of electrons does this compound have? All three types? Yeah, I see long pairs, pi, pi electrons, and sigma electrons, all three types. What's the lambda max for this compound? Wavelength of maximum absorption. It's right here, which is what? About, it's about 240. Here's your lambda max for this compound. Uh, it tails off. Right here, it's like something else is going on. It's not just sort of tailing off from this maximum. It's almost like something else happened, yeah? Well, it, it, it is. Uh, two things we can say here. Your pi to pi star transitions tend to be most intense. Pi to pi star tends to be your lambda max. Over here, this has been ascribed to, somebody has said, hey, this is probably the end of pi star transition, where the lone pairs are being excited to a pi. By the way, isn't it easy to excite lone pairs? So doesn't it make sense that this is a longer wavelength of light? Lower energy light is doing this. Higher energy light is needed to do this. But also remember, pi to pi star tends to be the most intense. That's one of the take home messages. Pi to pi star, most intense. Thus, your lambda max is often your pi to pi star. Why? Pi star tends to be most intense, most absor absorbent. Okay. This is called your uh, your global maximum. What might you call this? Not a global maximum, but a local local maximum. What's the tallest peak mountain in the in the world on Earth? Mount Everest. Isn't there another one? Well, let's Great call it Mount Everest. Okay. What's the tallest peak in, in North America? Mount McKinley? I will call it that. Mount Everest is your global maximum. Mount McKinley is a local maximum for North America. Okay. Uh, beta carotene. Hmm. Here's a UV vis. What's the lambda max? Right here, which is about what? About 440. Okay, question? Victoria? Why wouldn't the lambda max be the sigma of sigma star that has requires more Well, that's just going to make it, okay? Why is the lambda. Uh, First off, why is what to what? The lambda max is not sigma to sigma star. Sigma to sigma star is more energy than pi. To okay, sigma. first off, where would sigma to sigma star sh show up if pi to pi star is here? Oh, I see. I, I'm not sure. Sigma electrons are the most difficult to excite because they're held the tightest in a strong sigma bond. Those would be in the vacuum. Yes, they're going to be in the vacuum. But even if we had it shown here, 
It's not going to be as intense as pi to pi star. Just remember the statement. Pi to pi star tends to be your most intense. I mean, it may be here and it may look something like this. Where this was sort of the sigma. Pi to pi star is most intense. It's always going to typically be your lambda max. I don't know if I can exactly explain that quickly. Uh, why it is, but that's take home. Um, okay, beta carotene. By the way, the previous compound. Does this compound absorb in the visible? No. no. Well, it's kind of cut off here. It's almost like this is the end. Visible starts at 400. Doesn't look like it absorbs in the visible. What about beta carotene? Does it absorb in the visible? Yes. yes. The lambda max is 440. The maximum absorbance is in the visible. What's the consequence of that? If a compound absorbs visible light, what, what's the consequence? It will break down in regular light. It will be colored. Why is that, why is that paint blue? Some molecules in it are absorbing visible light. On the other hand, if a compound does not absorb, butadiene does not absorb visible light. We can see it from the UV vis spectrum. You can also tell that from looking at it. Butadiene is colorless, like water. It's the same color as water. Water does not absorb visible light. Well, it's not colored. It's colorless. Butadiene is colorless because it does not absorb visible light. We know that from seeing the graph and also from the fact that it's colorless, if you knew that already. What color do you think that compound is? Orange. Oh, wait. This compound. <laughs> does it absorb any visible light? No. Don't be colorless. Does beta, -car -car beta carotene absorb visible light? Yes. yes, a lot of it. The maximum absorbance is visible. It's going to be colored. What color will it be? Orange. I know it's going to be orange. Is it in carrots? Well, let's look in here. I'll move ahead a couple of. Why is it orange? You can tell that from the color wheel. Okay, the maximum absorbance is about 440 here, which, by the way, is what color? 440 is actually about blue. That's the higher energy end of uh, visible, which is violet blue. If you absorb blue, what color will you be? Orange. Orange, because orange is what you reflect. The pigment in that paint is not absorbing blue. It's reflecting blue from white light. If you remove what... What do you have to remove from white light to be blue, to reflect blue? Orange. You can tell that from the color wheel, the opposite side. If you absorb blue, you're going to reflect orange. And that's why beta carotene is orange, because it's mainly absorbing blue light. What, what color light is that pigment back there mainly absorbing? Orange. It's mainly absorbing orange. Why the difference? Well, let's go, let's go back and ask questions back over here. Why is this lambda max shifted to the right? Which, by the way, is called a redshift. Because it interacts with physical light. And I'll say, well, why? It has to do with conjugation. How many double bonds are conjugated here? This is a polyene. How many are conjugated? Maybe double double double. All of them, which is a total of what, 11? Yes, 11. The more conjugation you have, the closer your gap between your homo and lumo. What is homo and lumo? Did you learn this in gym? You didn't learn homo and lumo in gym? Homo Highest occupying, lowest occupying. 
Momo's Momo Momo is high occupied in like the orbital. Momo is what? Lowest unoccupied. Typically when you your first excitation is going to go from your homo to your lumo. typically comes from the pi to pi star. Pi electrons. Focus in on pi electrons. Homo lumo. Thus, to take an electron from here to here, it gets easier as you come across, right? The gap gets smaller. More conjugation, your gap is going to get smaller. Easier to excite. If you're easier to excite, which way are you moving? What type of light do you need? Weaker light. The more easier you are, the more you're going to move to the right, weaker light, if traditionally plotting. And you're going to move into, eventually, the visible. Okay? By the beta carotene orange, lots of conjugation moves the lambda max to weaker light. And it turns out it's moved it from here, previous examples. The weaker light, this weaker light is now visible. Since it's absorbing visible, it's going to be colored, and we use the color wheel to determine what color it will be. Uh, okay, this is a very common take home message type question here. Here we go. Rank in order from highest to lowest lambda max. Which would you expect to have the highest lambda max? Third one. Yes, we just reframed the question. What's the question really? Yeah, that's really the question, right? Which one is it? Yes, this one will be the highest. Then which one? Then this one. Then which one? Yes. Highest to lowest. Most conjugation. Three double bonds conjugated. Two double bonds conjugated. No double bonds conjugated. Two separate double bonds. Not conjugated, right? Which way does this go? Which compound will have the highest lambda max? You were these? Transylvine, the dibromide. Which would have the highest lambda max? More conjugation. Highest lambda max. Question, which one of these is more likely to be colored? The one on the right. The one on the right. Because the one on the left has more conjugation, so it shift the ground more and more right to the outside. More and more right into the visible? Well, outside the visible. No, not, you're never going to get outside the visible, not the back of the road. On the left. This one. Our lambda max means, we say higher lambda max, really it's the longer, I mean we're looking at the wavelength, we're calling it higher, higher number, longer, longer wavelength. This absorbs the lambda max the longest, longer wavelength, more into the visible, more likely to be into the visible. What color was the dibromide? You recrystallized it, you started with it this week. What color was it? The yellow, yellow, orange. No, your dibromide was pure white, wasn't it? Your purified dibromide? Yeah. Pure snow white. Yeah. Trans still being, it's not real pure white. It's got a tin of, uh, tin of yellow in it. Very small amount. By the way, what's the first color you're going to be when you move into the visible? Violet. Are you going to absorb violet? And if you absorb violet, we start with the visible right here. If you absorb into the visible right here, what color will you be? 
yellow. The first color that appears as a compound starts being colored is yellow. It'll go from pale white and then it'll start moving towards yellowish. Why? Because it's starting to absorb violet. And if you absorb violet, you're going to appear yellowish. So compound white, white, then pale yellow, and then it starts taking on the color. Which compound will have the highest amount of mass? Malik and hydride or the Diels Alder product? Malik and hydride. You've got three double bonds conjugated. Uh, when you look at a TLC plate, you're using UV light, short wave and long wave. Okay. Um, the plate has a dye on it, which when you shine UV on it, it actually fluoresces. There's not much to know here other than you do use a UV light in lab. Okay. Um, I'm running out of time here. I ran on and on a little bit. Did you use any indicators in Gentium to do titrations? Sometimes you want a certain pH is colorless and then the other, like basic, it becomes colored or something. Acid base indicators. Uh, phenolphthalein. Colorless form under basic conditions. I'm sorry, under acidic conditions. But under basic conditions, it becomes magenta. Magenta? Pink. Pink. Pinkish purple. Blue's clues? <laughs> okay, magenta. Why the difference? Well, look at the structure. Look at this, all this conjugation. All three rings are conjugated P orbital here. But in this form, this carbon is tetrahedral, no P orbital. And so the three benzene rings are isolated. But here it's conjugated all the way through. Increased conjugation, that structure absorbs in the visible. Here's magenta on your basic treatment. Acid, though, mechanistically, you protonate here, then these electrons attack here, these move here, these move here, and these move here. And that's how you get this bond made in the OH here. But now that's tetrahedral. This is how it exists under acidic conditions. And it's not colored. You go back to basic conditions, it'll go back to this form. So most of your indicators are like this. They go back between forms where one form is colorless, the other is colored. But it's all UV vis absorbance. Uh, we'll, we'll show the rest here uh, tomorrow. There's a few other miscellaneous things. A lot of good applications here. And if you haven't summed it up already, we'll sum it up again in the morning. Uh, tomorrow we'll look at radical reactions. There'll be 